We're back, and this week we're going to be showing you how to tunnel out of a restrictive network using only DNS queries. Very cool. We also sat down with Brian Drury from the FreeBSD Port Manager team to talk about all their building cluster and some recent changes. So all this and, of course, the latest news and answers to your email on BSD Now, your place to be, SD. Now, episode 46, Network Itometry, recorded July 16th, 2014. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Jude. And we're glad to have you guys with us this week. Uh, we were gone last week while Alan was out of the country over at uh, Cambridge for a uh, BSD conference. But uh, we're glad to have you back, Alan. And uh, of course, we have headlines to get in everything, but I'm sure you probably have a couple interesting things you want to tell us how it went there, your, your thoughts on the yeah, trip. It was uh, very good. We had a bunch of different working groups from kind of covering everything from packaging the base system to the random number generator, how to uh, deal with 64-bit Linux applications and the, and the mm -hmm. updated Linux relator and, and some security concerns around that as well. Um, okay. Power utilization, how that affects much, uh, kind of covered the spectrum from, you know, saving power on servers, making your laptop battery last longer, uh, how this is going to affect ARM, uh, we talked about um, some systems that have the two different processors on them and, and how to deal with that uh, and looking mm -hmm. at, you know, modifying the scheduler to consider power. So rather than trying to make all the apps run as fast as possible, it'd be like, well, try to leave, try to focus on a smaller number of processors and leave the other half idle so that they can switch off and save power. Sure. That kind of stuff. And there was lots of other interesting mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, so talk about L4, which is like a micro kernel and, uh, Mm. There was a, we're hoping to have an interview about that one uh, coming up soon as well. And then uh, nice. I got a couple other good interviews while I was there. I got uh, Robert Watson to talk about Capsicum and uh, his project Cherry and a bunch of other things. Uh, we're going to play that at like one third speed, <laughs> by the way. Gonna probably have to. He does talk fast, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he can cram a lot into a short interview. Yeah. Uh, and then I got uh, Doug Erling Smorgrave, the uh, security officer, and we talked about uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, including his uh, new library, Crib. Uh, and mm -hmm. then um, I also got an interview with the chairman of Zinuis, which is a company that's uh, that used to run SCO and now uh, provides commercial yep. support for enterprise operating systems. And uh, they've chosen FreeBSD as the base of uh, their products going forward. Uh, and cool. uh, so that also means that they will be selling commercial support for FreeBSD versions 10 and up. Uh, for 15 years for each version. Oh, man. Yeah, that's back yeah, that is backporting definitely a, a lot replacement of, to <laughs> That's backporting a lot of changes to keep uh, 10 all secure and stuff for 15 years. Yeah, I remember talking to those guys down at Tokyo earlier yes. in the year. They were out exactly. there as well. Uh, and they were out at the Dev that's Summit cool. and, and uh, dug into some of the stuff and talked about uh, they're using Beehive to actually run the old SCO stuff on top of FreeBSD currently. It's like a transition uh, for some mm -hmm. customers that still need the old stuff. And uh, lots of other interesting stuff. And and although at the Dev Summit, we talked a lot about what they're going to be providing the FreeBSD project with. A lot of the, the sure. testing and stuff that nobody wants to do as a volunteer mm -hmm. is basically what they do as a business. And so if they can yeah. run all these tests and find the problems and report them so we can fix them, that'll be a benefit to both. Oh, that's great. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. I think that's probably the longest supported FreeBSD we've seen from a business we, perspective. As long as supported anything I've ever seen. Yeah, fifteen years. Well, I mean, I you know, I used to work on Sco right. before I did this, and yeah, you'd run into some ones that were you know twelve, thirteen. Well, yeah, they're talking so. about you know, like it's embedded in cache registers, and they don't mm -hmm. always think that oh, we should do a software update on that. It's more like no, we want everything to be perfectly stable and secure, and just you know, we don't want any new features that might cause a problem <laughs> and sure. things like that. Sure. Well, cool. It sounds like you had a good productive yes. trip. Did they record videos of the um, talks? There's audio of some of them. There might be video as well. Okay. Um, and, uh, we also had little talklets, uh, like lightning talks, and those were recorded. Uh, and yeah, we'll have to bug, uh, a bug. Jonathan Anderson, I think, was in charge of the recordings. Okay. 
Very cool. Well, that's great, Alan. I'm sure we'll discuss more of that as the show goes on and and, uh, things come to mind. But uh, we'll first get into our headlines. So uh, this week, we do want to mention the next conference coming up, uh, EuroBSDCon 2014. The registration is now open for this. So if you're planning on going or would like to, go hit up the link in the show notes and take a look at the registration page. It's going to be held in uh, September, which I think, uh, what was it, 25th? 25th to 28th. Uh, with the, yes. the conference part is the 27th and 28th, and then there's uh, the two days prior are developer summits. There's FreeBSD and mm-hmm. BSD developer summits, and uh, as well there's uh, tutorials. So if you're just a user and you want to learn some stuff, there's some really great tutorials uh, mm-hmm. and other stuff. Uh, I was going to mention if you're a Dev Summit or you're interested in going to the Dev Summit, be sure to register for that and add yourself to the wiki page or find somebody who can add right, you yes. as a guest. Uh, specifically, the developer summits are invite only, but uh, if mm-hmm. you feel you can contribute, I'm sure someone will invite you. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to have you there. So I guess uh, pricing looks like for businesses, it'll be 287 uh, individuals 217 students $82 for the main conference until August 18th. So get your registrations in. You have just about a month. Ah, that's what the problem. You're that. looking at the wrong number. Okay, so there's early oh. bird pricing. If you register within the next okay. month, it's uh, an individual is only 159 instead oh, of okay. 210 Oh, so okay, we do have that in the notes. One fifty nine instead of that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if you register before August eighteenth, you get uh, quite a discount. All right. Well, we need to update that those notes then after the show, so that we're putting the right info out there. Let's see after August eighteenth. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, seems as bad. Yeah. So uh, there you go. Yeah, an individual registration is one fifty nine instead of two ten, mm-hmm. and a uh, student is sixty euros instead of eighty four euros. Oh yeah. Well, that's a good savings then. Yes. yes, get it in soon. Yeah. Do this. It helps the conference a lot if you yeah. register sooner rather than later, so they know how many people are going to be, so they can get enough, yeah. uh, big enough rooms and stuff. Uh, when everybody mm-hmm. registers that last minute, they're like, "Oh, now we need more rooms." Oh, now we need to change yeah. stuff up the last second. Yeah, and of course, prices are probably higher for them yeah, too. Yeah, it's hard so. to do. And so yeah, uh, and then you can add on tutorials uh, for the Thursday and, and or Friday and. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they have lots of great stuff there. I think they have a, a list of some of the tutorials. Uh, also, they have a side program if you have uh, if you're bringing your partner or your kids or something. Uh, since you know mm-hmm. it's a nice place to come and see, they have uh, a side program so that you know they're not just sitting in the hotel while you're at the conference the whole day. Um, and so that's that's cool. Uh, some of the tutorials they have are an introduction to FreeBSD. Uh, open source operating system by Kirk McCusick and that runs the both days and it goes through it's like a condensed version of one of his uh, courses. They also have mm-hmm. uh, building the network you need with PF from Peter Hanstein, uh, subversion for FreeBSD developers, uh, which is an interesting mm-hmm. one, especially if you want to get into this and you don't know about subversion, if you're used to a different source code management tool or sure. you've just not done much with source code management before, you definitely learn stuff mm-hmm. there. Uh, Peter Hansen also has transitioning to OpenBSD 5.6. Uh, and oh, then cool. uh, the OpenBSD projects, Ingo Suarez has Let's Make Manuals More Useful, uh, which looks nice. like a really interesting one to, to go to. Okay. Well, it sounds like there's going to be some good tutorials to hit if you can make it exactly. to them. We also want to mention, too, the FreeBSD Foundation also put out a blurb that they're accepting applications for travel grants. Yes. So if you're doing something of interest to the foundation or, or would like to see if they could sponsor you, uh, hit up the link in the show notes here. Yep. It's, see uh, if you can uh, qualify for exactly. that. Exactly. They have uh, a budget to send people to these conferences because uh, so much gets done at the conferences, right? Being able to meet with uh, mm-hmm. developers you're working with in person uh, provides a lot of value. And so, uh, yeah, if... Uh, you can't make it to the conference, uh, but would like to, the FreeBSD Foundation would be interested in helping you out. Cool. And uh, they also have a page oh. up here with the hotels. Uh, you can see mm-hmm. they kind of got a range from you know, your five stars and down, and they have a nice little map where you can kind of trade off. I was like, this hotel's a little bit cheaper, but it's this much further away. Do I want to, which one do I want to go to, and so on. Mm-hmm. Have you booked your hotel uh, yet, yes, Alan? Okay, uh, good deal. I, I made I sure we did that. At the Sofia Hotel Balkan, yes, right? Same here. Good. Uh, okay. Because uh, I wanted to get a room before they all got taken. So I'm like, I'm going to get mine before we advertise it to everybody. And they take all the rooms. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, that, that happened in Cambridge. We got one of the, I, got, I think, the last two rooms in the, in the college we were staying at. And so the second room, one of my rooms was on the first floor and the other was on the fifth floor. <laughs> 
So it looks like the deadline for the reservations at that hotel is the 27th of August. Yeah. After so just an FYI. Yeah, after that, if there are any rooms left over in the block, they become open to everybody, not reserved for the conference. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you'll have much yeah. less of a chance. Your luck may vary. Yes. And after that, I don't. you don't get the guaranteed pricing either. You get uh, their regular pricing. Ooh, they updated with nice uh, Google Maps exactly. too, showing where the hotels are in relation to the conference and the yes. airport. That is Which helpful. Which is very important. It's like For those I need of to us who have never been there <laughs> exactly. before. Exactly. <laughs> I've never been to Bulgaria. I need to be able to get from the airport to my hotel and every day yep. from my hotel to the venue. Cool. And there's okay, uh, well, instructions uh, on here somewhere on how, how to navigate the... Uh, yeah, for each hotel, it, yeah, for each hotel yeah. it explains how to use the subway system to get to uh, the conference each day. Oh, that would be yeah. fun. I'm looking forward to uh, getting out exactly. there and uh, seeing this. See, uh, I guess first time, your first time to Bulgaria as well, yeah. right, Alan? Okay, well, that should be a blast. I've only ever been to Europe for the purpose of BSD conferences. <laughs> Ditto here. <laughs> it's always a conference yeah. related. Cool. Okay, well, next up, uh, we have some news about OpenBSD, uh, I guess an interesting firestorm of uh, SMP PF discussion kind of got kicked off uh, a couple weeks ago. Just to bring you up to speed, we talked about how Dragonfly updated their PF to be multi-threaded. And, uh, you know, with them now having SMP support along with FreeBSD, a lot of users have been asking, you know, when OpenBSD is going to make the jump. So I guess somebody posted something along those lines to the uh, mailing lists. And uh, what would you say, Alan, all hell broke loose? Or I would no? say there, yeah, there was just a, a discussion <laughs> happened. And uh, specifically, they kind of adopted the point that rather than uh, trying to SMPI's uh, PF, that it's maybe more general work should be done so that everything in OpenBSD could benefit from it instead of just doing all the work on PF alone. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, so, well, and there were some good points they had, too, that the newer version of PF on OpenBSD is already much, much faster. Right. I said four times faster than FreeBSD's old version. So, yeah, and uh, that was most, uh, uh, mostly algorithmic changes and so on. Of course, mm-hmm. you know, if you take that and made it SMP, it could be X times faster, where X is the number of processors you have. For me, sure. that's like 24. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I guess there's other there's other aspects of you know what needs to be changed in OpenBSD yep. as well to do that. You know, if some of the the lower level things aren't SMP aware, then yeah. it's not going to give you a lot of performance boosts just to make PF right. Because uh, I don't I think the the network cards don't use multiple queues in OpenBSD as far as I know uh, because they don't really mm-hmm. do the SMP. Whereas in uh, especially if you have a, a fancier gig or ten gig card on FreeBSD it will spread its load across multiple processors specifically to take advantage of those and prevent, you know, one processor from getting bogged down with all of the packets. Uh, But yeah, so they say the short version is that there are too many things in OpenBSD that are currently single-threaded for it to matter much, so just working on PF itself wouldn't be that helpful, whereas they could solve the entire underlying problem instead, that would be better. Although, you know, that's Mm -hmm. a bigger change. Well, related to that, there was a thread on the FreeBSD list talking about uh, the future of PF and FreeBSD. You know, does it have one? I mean, it's an older fork. So where is it going from here? Are they going to at some point update it? And, you know, some of the people are saying, I'm going to switch back to IPFW, et cetera. So interesting thread. A lot of yeah. different well, opinions Well, IPFW there has gotten what the future a, a is. lot of work uh, recently as well to make it better mm-hmm. at SMP. And it's very, very fast, although uh, for certain, it, doing NAT's okay, but if you're trying to do something where you're going to port forward into NAT, PF is, or IPFW's NAT is just not all that configurable. Uh, sure. But uh, and I still like IPFW. I use it well, here yes, for rate it. limiting and stuff using dummy exactly. NAT. Exactly. That's, that's my main things. use of it. And that's what I wrote an article about mm-hmm. that in the, the FreeBSD journal. Uh, and, yeah. you know, the fact that you can use both is also kind of helpful. But uh, that is true. Um, that is true. I know at the Dev Summit, not the, so much the one in Cambridge, but uh, at BSD CAN, there was quite a bit of talk about trying to um, abstract the APIs and stuff so that we uh, FreeBSD could import newer versions of PF, but on top of that, provide the stable configuration file so that if there's another change in PF going forward, we can import that change sooner rather than later without breaking the existing. Uh, config files people will have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know if there's a, a specific plan yet, but I do know that people are thinking about it and trying to uh, work on PF. And I wouldn't expect PF to just go away in FreeBSD at any point. Soon. Sure, no, not at all. Not at all. 
Well, we do want to put a plug out there too. We've tried to reach out to some different developers um, from the OpenBSD project who maybe could come on and enlighten us on how network performance and SMP all relate to what goes on in OpenBSD. I mean, you know, honestly, me and Alan are both FreeBSD guys primarily, so it'd be kind of enlightening to have somebody do that. If uh, if that's you, get in, get in touch with us. Yeah. Let us know. We'd love to have you come on the show and just uh, fill in all our gaps and knowledge. Well, it'd here. be also just interesting maybe to talk to someone who maybe isn't even a developer, but happens to run OpenBSD in a really high performance mm-hmm. network environment where maybe they're routing 10 gigs of traffic and it's like yeah, yeah we can handle that even though we're we're not multi-threading pf sure cool okay well next article we have in the headlines here an introduction to netbsd's package source so this is actually a pretty cool introduction on how to uh Get it all set up here. It's uh, pretty long in detail. Yes, now. and also it's on uh, saveosx.org. So I imagine it's it's taking advantage <laughs> of the fact that package source can actually uh, run across a number of different platforms, including mm-hmm. NBSD, Linux, uh, Mac OS X, and Smart OS. That is cool. That uh, is cool. One of the other cool things but about I- it is that it basically provides its own tool chain that it bootstraps. And uh, what this means is that it doesn't depend on whichever compiler you have on your system. It brings its own uh, so that it mm-hmm. works across all those different systems. Cool. Well, I guess this post, I mean, if you call it, it's pretty much a full article. It's more than just a post, but it starts off with how to get the package source tree, how to get the development tools, and it finally goes through make file formatting. Yeah, like I think it, it actually covers it. making a port here. Yeah, it does. At the end, it eventually walks you through creating a new port. So that's a pretty stinking complete article. So if this is something you've ever wanted to play with or tinker around with, this may be a good way to get your feet wet with package source. Somebody should do the same also, thing for the FreeBSD ports tree. Just like the Porter's Handbook is very good, but uh, kind of like sure. a quick start guide. It's like, you know, a tutorial. Let's make our first port. This is how we do it. Yeah. You know, I got to find something that isn't that, already ported and do it. That isn't that you know, would be cool. CentOS 7, which is very complicated to port. Yeah, yeah. Something fairly basic and straightforward <laughs> without a 2,000 line long P list and a lot of variations in it and stuff. Well, yes, that, that was some of the crazy stuff I'm going to be dealing with the last couple of days. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it actually turned out the, um, the, the port we were using in today's tutorial, uh, Iodine, it turns out the FreeBSD mm-hmm. port was slightly broken. And so I, I had to write a patch for it before I could do the tutorial this morning. Oh, nice. Well, cool. Well, next up, we have some release information this yes. week. I guess FreeBSD 9.3 release is now out. Yes. So I guess they uh, did three RCs first, but they uh, they had scheduled it and finally filed and analyzed it and announced it today. Mm-hmm. But it did come out yesterday, so you may have grabbed it a little yes, earlier. Yes, I've actually so we... installed it on three servers already. <laughs> oh, see, there you go, man. So they have a a pretty good uh, release notes page here, which will describe some of the differences, what's changed. There's a fairly long list of security advisories. Yeah, that's um, that's everything that's been fixed since 9.2 release. Correct, correct. So a lot of good stuff in here, but uh, there's now, I mean, as far as kernel changes go, we got iSCSI drivers now loadable via KLD load. Yeah, uh, so they have the uh, newer uh, HPA controllers for the Acrea and Intel RAID. Oh, and the Intel one is actually mm-hmm. KLD loadable now as well. Uh, system level CCTLs uh, for the um, the Intel 10 gigabit cards, the updated LSI Mega RAID for the Invader controllers. Mm-hmm. Fixed a kernel panic related to ZFS root, mm-hmm. so that's cool. We got a DevFS IO size uh, Max Clamp CCTLs, which have been added, which... Uh, Make some changes to how DevFS works with uh, max sized IO requests. That was done by the FreeBSD Foundation or sponsored by. Let's see, oh. fixed kernel panics triggered by unmounting a busy ZFS file system. That one actually that hit important. me a couple of days ago, so yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and I see they have a, a CCTL you can enable that stops binaries for a newer version of FreeBSD from running on your system. So if you're Ooh. running. 10 and you try to run a, an 11 binary it will actually stop it rather than letting it kind of work and cause problems oh that's good. that could be that's very cool. handy on when you're testing stuff and and playing with multiple versions and you're like why isn't yeah. this working oh it turns out i'm doing something i shouldn't be sure sure we got uh ata drivers been updated to support coletto creek devices ahci now has a uh, pci express solid state support for the apple airbook model a1465. Uh, so, so yes, that. if you have the, the directly attached uh, SSD, 
in the MacBook Air, you can use that now. That's cool. That is cool. Oh, awesome. Cool. Uh, they changed the ZFS uh, arc meta limit so it can be changed at runtime. Uh, what this does is controls what percentage of your arc can be used to store just metadata. And on one of my workloads, uh, the default of like one quarter is not high enough. We store almost exclusively hmm. metadata. And so to tune that, I've had to previously change it in loader.conf and reboot. Now I'll be able to change it at runtime. That is a great okay. change. That is, that is. Let's see. It looks like they fixed some problems with uh, the um, panics by some multi-threaded applications as well. I might be jumping ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that one here. is the, uh, I don't know if that's the PMAP one or not, but yeah, they fixed some uh, mm -hmm. Broadcom drivers. Uh, ah, the new kern.supported underscore arches has been added, uh, which will list all mm -hmm. of the uh, architectures that your kernel can support. And fixed a memory leak related to L2ARC write, so that's mm -hmm. important. Let's see, uh, deadlock by sending mounted ZFS snapshots has been fixed. Uh, added a sysctl panic reboot wait time. How long the system should wait after a panic before it reboots for you to read the message. Uh, hmm. That could okay. always be handy. It's like, I don't want it to just sit there forever, but if I happen to be there, being able to have more than a couple of seconds to read it would be very helpful. Sure. A couple other things. NVA driver or NVE driver has been depreciated. The NFE should be used instead. It's, so it's been uh, going there. on for a while. The Radeon KMS driver has been added to 9.3. Yes, uh, so 9.3 has all the VT and new XORG stuff. Uh, so it'll uh, you'll be able to use your Intel graphics and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. And they have a huge list of network drivers here that have all been updated for newer uh, chipsets. Yep. And, uh, let's see. ZFS file system got the bookmarks feature. So if that's something you've been looking forward yep. to, it's now in 9.3. I just remember that once you do a uh, ZPool upgrade, you can't go back. So... If you still have, if you're in an environment where you still have a bunch of 9.2s and 9.3s, you might not want to upgrade your ZPool right away. And uh, they added the MPR driver, the new uh, LSI Fusion 12 gigabits per second SATA, uh, SAS controller. That's a, hmm, a cool okay. one we've been waiting for. That is definitely cool. We see a lot of user land changes. We oh, got they, uh, uh, Fetch getting SNI support. Ah, yes, that was a big one. But also a kernel bug that inhibited. Um, the frequency control from working properly on some Intel processors with Turbo Boost. Uh, so now that can make a big difference mm -hmm. for performance on uh, laptops and servers. Oh, this one will be handy. New GMIR command, GMIR destroy, has been added, which will destroy the geom and erase the metadata. Yes, Thank you. that was always so annoying. It's like, <laughs> that was make annoying. It go away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm like, why does it keep coming back? <laughs> well, that's cool. Let's see, uh, the utility now prevents you from deactivating the last component of a mirror accidentally. Mm -hmm. So that is, is that cool. You don't break stuff. Uh -huh. ah, the, that see. change to the uh, Blowfish cryptographic hash has been implemented. So mm -hmm. now all hashes you make will actually be dollar sign 2B instead of 2A. Uh, and this is fixes the problem with uh, what happens when you use 8-bit characters and it can sometimes cause problems. Um, so cool. it'll still work with the old ones, but it'll save all new passwords as the new format, uh, and that will uh, prevent the, the problem from going forward. Cool. Receiving ZFS data sets with ZFS receive dash capital F now will properly destroy snapshots that were created since the incremental source. Uh -huh. So that could be helpful. Yes. I may have to look at adding that to our replication scripts. Yes. Even. Also, um, have an here's already. one that I think actually our, our guest this week, Brian Drury, uh, worked on, is uh, newsyslog.conf can now include files from etc newsyslog.conf.d so that uh, mm -hmm. when you install ports, they can automatically create entries in your new syslog, you know, for like a web oh, server, like Nginx or Apache or something, so that anything that yeah. has its own log will add rules to rotate that log so it doesn't eat up your entire disk. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, that's Another really cool. big one is uh, the new flag on if console for etc TTYs. Um, this uh, was added for Beehive. Uh, basically, it means when the system boots up, if the first serial port is the console because there's no video card, it'll actually be turned on instead of off. So this means you'll be able hmm. to use uh, 9.3 stock with no changes um, and run it in Beehive. So you'll be able to grab the uh, virtual machine images that uh, Glenn Barber makes available like the snapshots 
uh, directly into a beehive without having to mount it and fiddle with the TTYs file before you can use it. Okay. Well, that's sweet. And the uh, arc for random uh, system call has been updated to match what's currently on FreeBSD-Current. Mm -hmm. Let's see. They updated some periodic scripts to detect uh, more authentication failures and reduce false positives. That's, that's very helpful. useful. They did the first boot scripts got ported back. Yep, so that, that's, uh, uh, that's the stuff Colin Percival did so that uh, mm -hmm. you could create a disk image and then the first thing it does when it boots up is run FreeBSD update and get all the security fixes so that that way you don't have to remake the image every time there's a security update. You'll know that when you fire it up, it will update itself. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Uh, just some other stuff here for RC scripts. Uh, RC system will now resource rc.conf on receipt of sig alarm. Yep. And uh, uh, the ports update is that the newer version of Xorg is now the default. Uh, so mm -hmm. 93 will have all the fancy new Xorg stuff and uh, basically be KMS aware so you can use the, the new uh, VT and KMS stuff, which will make a big difference. Which will warn you about that. As soon as you load up anything with KMS, you lose your console at the moment. And uh, that'll be until the new VT driver gets yep. added and compiled in. Yes, lots of this will not affect NVIDIA users. Let's see. Oh, they uh, got rid of KD4 packages, but they're available in the new well, XORG repository. Them. Uh, the KD4 can only compile with new XORG, so it can't do the yeah. old version. So it's it's in this alternative new XORG yeah. repository. And then, okay, they, well, that yeah. looks and then like they have instructions on how to update from your existing version to mm -hmm. uh, 9.3. That looks like the bulk yep. of it. Yeah, lots of good stuff there, though. So if you're still on the 9 branch, definitely a worthy upgrade. But uh, we will mention that 9.2's end of life was extended until December of this year, so yes. you still have a little bit of time. Uh, yes, there was quite a bit of confusion year. over the fact that uh, 9.1 was actually going to outlive 9.2 because of the alternating short-long release cycle. And mostly mm -hmm. just that uh, 9.2 EOL was coming up very soon and wasn't leaving that much of a, a window to upgrade to 9.3. And so they've, uh, sure. um, Dick Erling announced today that they're extending the, uh, the window slightly so that people will have time to, uh, to upgrade to, uh, nine three. Cool. Cool. And it looks like they also posted a 10.1 release schedule, which, yes. uh, looks like they're going to start doing a code freeze around 5th of September and then followed by a bunch of betas, release candidates, with hopefully a release late October is what they're shooting yep. for, October so, 24th. So uh, by November, we should have FreeBSD 10.1. That's fantastic. So, matter of fact, I will have to send some emails out about how we're going to do our releases then based on yes. the knowledge that that's coming out around November-ish. So, very cool. Okay. Well, I guess that's the end of this week's headlines. But, of course, uh, before we go to our next segment, we do want to mention the sponsor for this yes. week. So uh, who are we going to start with this uh, week? We Alan? have IX Systems. It's their turn to go first. Uh, and yep. so uh, the news they have is that FreeNAS 9216 has actually been released now. Uh, okay. So that's all the way out there. We've watched the release candidates for that go by, and uh, now it's actually out uh, with mm -hmm. all the latest stuff, including that MPR driver, which uh, they had before it actually went into FreeBSD 9.3. Uh, they were helping LSI develop and test that. Um, they also have new USB images so that you can uh, install FreeNAS from a USB key. Uh, lots of iSCSI fixes. A uh, special shell you can set for a user called SCP only that only allows the user to mm -hmm. SCP files but not actually get a shell. Uh, oh, they've updated okay. the VirtualBox template so you can run VirtualBox on top of your FreeNAS, uh, which is something like a million people have asked me for. <laughs> sure, sure. So it's good to see that. And they have the security fixes for the... Um, file and libmagic uh, vulnerabilities that were announced a couple weeks ago. Okay, fantastic. And we do want to mention, too, it looks like they released their new first uh, TrueNAS Unified Storage. Ooh. Yes. So what is this here? It looks like uh, we'll have some this links you can click uh, on in the show notes, by the way. This is the commercial version of, um, the, of FreeNAS. FreeNAS. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's the one where you know, you'd have two separate head controllers managing one common set of disks. Um, you can get them with crazy things like the Zeus RAM or the um, Fusion I/O cards, so like ridiculously fast SSD stuff or RAM uh, for the with the Arc, the L2 Arc, and your storage and self-healing mm -hmm. and 
does, you know, Civ, Sanifest, and iSCSI and all that stuff. Um, and it's basically the adding the high availability and other enterprise features that uh, you don't get with FreeNAS. That's really cool. Of course, this all comes with iX Systems' uh, standard white glove mm -hmm. post-purchase support. So uh, if you want professional support, they will do it right. And of course, uh, iX Systems builds a lot of different things, everything from the mini boxes that Alan and I have sitting under our desk all the way up to you know massive systems like some of the stuff you'll see on their website and we've featured on the show in the past. But uh, I think on their site here, they list some of the different models yes, they have. I'm just looking at the box. last one right now, the Z35. 1.15 <sighs> petabytes of storage, uh, 40 yeah, gigabits of wow. network capacity, 4 terabytes of flash L2 arc. Read cache. Oh, man. Uh, it's VMware certified. So you can actually, like, it's actually certified by VMware uh, to, to mm -hmm. use as the backing, as well as by Citrix. Uh, it's got hybrid storage pools, so you have the layers. Uh, Intelligent compression, all the SIFs, NFS, and AFP you might expect, iSCSI, and uh, the high availability features. And that's on that's standard on all of their models. It looks yep. like you're just choosing between different hardware and storage size. Yep. So and everything. How, how much the, the three models need. start at 240 terabytes, go up to 1.15 petabytes. Yes, wow. A very large amount of disks. That is incredible. Very, very incredible. So again, um, we haven't even mentioned the URL yet, but ixsystems.com slash BSD now. You know, if these are things that light your fire and you want to find out more, definitely go there and get in touch with the guys at IX. Let them know that uh, we sent you and they will be happy to discuss and figure out what particular needs you have in your set of circumstances for your business, be it big or small. They can try and find something that they can customize to uh, your liking. That'll yep. do exactly what you want. And, and of course, that uh, thing all done sexy. with their fan. Oh, it does. Like it does. They, they, and... Yeah. Yeah, that would look really good. That's one of those ones you take people back to your rack. Yes. You just have <laughs> so a rack with that kind of way. stuff in it. You know, not this yes. other rack that's yes. full of mix and match different servers with different colors and <laughs> scratches and stuff. Definitely. Yeah, that is really yes. cool. Really, really cool. Of course, all powered by Intel Xeon processors, yes. we want to mention. All the but, uh, latest yeah. fanciness. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, uh, we'll be back in just a moment with our next segment. Uh, stay tuned. Okay, we're joined now by uh, Brian Drury of the uh, FreeBSD Project. Good to have you with us today, Brian. Hi. Yes. Hey, so uh, first question that we hit everyone with. So go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. How did you get mixed up into BSD and uh, start using it? Uh, somewhere around 2003, from IRC, I, I knew some people running some shell companies and I got involved with them and they were running FreeBSD 4, 11, um, and the rest is kind of history. Mm -hmm. And uh, somewhere around 2012, I decided I wanted to use packages on my own systems and did not like the state, state of uh, package install. And I actually ran into the Package NG project and found Baptiste there. And from there, I started contributing patches directly to Package NG, and that eventually led me into ports and getting a commitment there. Cool. Cool. Uh, so now, uh, what hats do you wear for the FreeBSD projects? What are your different jobs? Uh, well, I'm on Port Manager, and that has a lot of different responsibilities. And I've also recently gotten a source bit as well, and I've been doing <laughs> some work over there. Um, I don't have any other hats though. I, I the liaison between port manager and the RE team, but that's not really doing much except for chiming in every now and then on, on an email thread. Okay. So what was the process kind of like going from just being a regular ports committer to becoming part of port manager? Um, it was kind of scary at first. It was mm -hmm. a big change. <laughs> it was kind of overwhelming at first. At at, at first, I admit. Um, but once I settled into it, it, it's just kind of the norm for me now. And, did, uh, did you have to pursue it or did they ask you or how'd that work? I was, it was mostly because of my interest in packaging and package NG and Poudrier and all the work I had put into those two projects. Mm -hmm. I became a, a perfect fit for that team. Really people who, and a lot of work I had done on the framework, uh, people who work on the framework are work on packaging or work on testing usually end up in port manager. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if you're, if you're helping develop the infrastructure and the tools, what better person to operate the tools for the project, right? Yeah. yeah. And by being a port manager, you get easier access to more resources, more servers, and and different people that can help you with things. Uh, so can you tell us cool. what's been going on lately with PackageNG? Yes. Um, we have the release candidate out for 1.3. It's package Devel. Hopefully that gets released soon. That's been mm -hmm. worked on for the past um, maybe a year. I'm not sure. But one of the major features of it is that you will no longer need to run package set dash O when you want to change the origin on a package. And there's mm -hmm. a major version upgrade. Uh, Sebka has he's a he was a Google Summer of Code member, you know, student. And now he's one of the major contributors to PKG. He has written a whole new solver for package so it can decide between different packages to fulfill a requirement for a dependency. And that allows us to not have to use package set O for majority of cases. So that should make it much easier for users to use. Yep. Uh, what about in 1.4? Uh, 1.4, one four. One four, the major feature that's on the roadmap is for modern dependencies, is what we're calling them. And that's going to require a lot of ports changes as well. And what that will be doing is uh, provides requires idea. So a port instead mm -hmm. of require uh, requiring just uh, a specific origin and version of Perl, it'll just take any version of Perl. So you mm -hmm. can decide what default Perl you want to install, and you can still use packages because they just want any version of Perl. Interesting. So flexible dependencies. Um, right. Will that also tie into like build options and stuff, like being able to say I want it with this build option or not, or is that on the roadmap? I, I know Baptiste has talked about flavors of packages. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly what he has in mind for that, though. So uh, okay. what about new features in Poudriere? Poudriere, the last release was May 2013, uh, version 3.0, I believe it was. And I've got version 3.1, that I need to get released, and it's got a whole a whole list of changes. Uh, What's some of the big ones? Some of the big ones is uh, it's faster, it's got more testing. Uh, you can now do dry mode bulk runs to see what would build. It mm. has what I've been calling atomic package repository. So instead of modifying your packages in place, uh, deleting packages from the directory for which you're serving over HTTP, it will build it in a different directory, and then when the build is done, it will sync those files over to the main directory. Yes. And this That's is all using hard links, so it's it's very quick and it's not using that much extra space. Mm -hmm. And through that, you also get a, a dry mode, so you can run a build in this uh, shadow directory, or at least uh, start the build and have it delete files and then not actually affect your production repository. Yeah, I've had that problem where I've decided cool. to... Uh do a Poudre run, and then at the same time I was trying to install a new server, and then it's like, sorry, there is no Perl package. I'm currently rebuilding yeah. that mm -hmm. Perl package. It's like, oops. Yep. <laughs> One thing at a time. And then, and then the other big feature is a wholly new designed web interface where you Ooh, can... Yay. There's a top-level page now that shows all of your jails. You can drill down into that jail and see all of the builds for that jail, and then you can go into the build, and then that's the familiar interface that's in 3.0, but it's even that's changed quite a bit to be more uh, responsive to smaller screens and mobile. Oh, fantastic. I kind of, yeah, I'm always trying to do that in the web browser on my phone. It's uh, a little difficult. I, I never pictured anyone yeah. looking at the web interface of Poudreware on their phone, but I suppose it happens. Oh, yeah. I do it often. Oh, I got Jenkins on my phone. I do that, so naturally yeah. I'm going to look at Poudreware too. <laughs> what about running uh, Poudreware in a jail? How has that come along? You can do that today. There's just a few file systems that you cannot use because they're not allowed to be used in a jail. Mm -hmm. You can patch your kernel to allow them if you want. There's just, there's just security concerns about using mm -hmm. those inside of a jail so they're not on by default. But um, at, my, at my work, we build packages in, in a jail, with Poudre are running in a jail, and it works just fine. Without having to? Just don't build it. Without the patches? Without Without patches, okay. yeah. We, we can't build, you can't build the entire port tree, but you can build a lot of them. I should try that because uh, it, it just messes the jail numbers up when you, you get like your 65,000th jail. And 
Oh, that's that's fixed in three one oh, okay. as well. That, oh, that's great. a subtle fix in that it doesn't um, it won't increase your jail numbers anymore. Oh, that's also handy. <laughs> At least not as quick a rate yeah. as it did before. Before every build, it would stop the jail, enable networking, and start the jail again. Uh, it would do this like four times for each port. Mm -hmm. And now instead, it just starts two jails at the beginning, one with network and one without. And then it just runs the, um, the sandbox commands in the non-network jail and uh, the, the, port, the disk file fetching in the network jail. And that mm. stops, that, that improves performance. Uh, lowers lock contention on restarting jail so often, and also uh, fixes the jail ID raising so high. Oh, awesome. So quickly. Very cool. Can you give us a little bit of the behind-the-scenes info about how the, the package build cluster and how you run it, what kind of hardware, how is it managed? Sure. Um, there's, I'll, I'll tell you about it, but there's also more information in the, uh, the FreeBC Journal issue, too. Mm -hmm. I wrote an article there about all of this. But... We have um, four machines that we call beefy. They've got, um, I think, 32 CPU and uh, 96 to 100 gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. And every Tuesday night, it's 1 a.m. Wednesday UTC, we, we take a snapshot of the port tree and then start building packages for each of the releases and uh, architectures and head. This is only for x86. Mm -hmm. And then that takes... Uh, between three to five days to build all the packages, depending on how much has changed. Um, and then we also have recently have set up a system to do other builds that are not the production builds. So now we have a new Xorg repository mm -hmm. uh, that's that users can manually configure to use. Uh, and then I've also set up the infrastructure for doing test repositories. So I have one for SSP packages that I actually need to announce and get testing for. And then once that gets tested, we'll just enable that default in the main repository. Um, hmm. But I also, I also did a test on that system for building packages without X11, but it turned out we didn't have enough space for all of it, so I had to delete it for now. Oh. <laughs> um, and then other than that, we also do a lot of daily testing that we don't quite communicate very well. Um, I think we've got like eight different systems doing daily builds of the entire ports tree on different releases. Uh, we have one running building packages without root user building as a non-root. Uh, we have some that just test if it can if ports will package. Other ones are doing mm -hmm. plist and QA testing. Um, is that the like package fallout stuff or is that separate? No, package, package fallout is the weekly package okay. builds because mm -hmm. we don't want to flood users too often or maintainers with these emails. But we do actually get a very good idea of, of um, how many ports are building and failing and changing every day. And we've been making a lot of progress towards improving the failing packages and broken packages. And we do need to do better at uh, getting this data out so everyone else can know about it, and even notifying maintainers that their port broke on Saturday, even though it was fine on the build on Tuesday, because they won't get notified until the following Tuesday for package follow-up. Right. If you can give them a chance to fix it before the next build, then it's one more less build with it broken, right? Right. Mm -hmm. right. And then we also have the, uh, the quarterly branches now. That's something that's new. And we also build packages for that branch, and we take a snapshot from head or we branch from head once a quarter and then we merge back security and critical fixes to that branch. It's kind of a stable branch where it's, it's still kind of an experiment, but it's working out pretty well. Uh, yeah, Baptiste mentioned so, a bit about that, but uh, do you have enough manpower for that? It's That's all for the, the porters and it's people have been picking it up pretty well. We got a lot more traction than we thought we would with porters merging their changes over. Mm -hmm. Definitely, so you, we'd like to see more of that. And there is um, recently the charter for the port security team has changed, and hopefully that team can get uh, can recruit a bunch of people and start becoming active and merging these security fixes over to that branch more often. Now how do you guys manage all these systems? What's uh, what kind of framework do you use? Um, Nothing really. Okay. <laughs> That's I've only recently started working on 
on getting the configuration files into a system mm -hmm. and uh, working on deployment scripts and, and all of that. And we, we, use auto, we use our own custom-made scripts for automatically building the packages and updating the channels and the porch trees. Sure. We, we kind of grew quickly. We started out with just two machines, and then we had more machines and just more kept getting thrown at us. And um, it's been an ongoing project of mine to better manage those systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there was also some talk about uh, including the snapshot of the ports tree that the package build was built with in the package set. Yeah, I, I have a I have a script that will generate a ports a package for that, but I ran into a bug with package and I I haven't PKG and I haven't had a chance to get back to it. But it's pretty trivial, and we do plan to have a ports package included with the repository. Cool. That's very cool. Yeah, so I guess you've already talked about the, the testing and stuff, but uh, is there anything else that uh, people can do to make it easier or to, to get more testing done? Well, recently, in the past six months, uh, Matt, Anton, Mandry, and I have all moved a lot of the testing into the ports framework itself. So now we have mm -hmm. make check plist or make check uh, orphans. It's, they're an alias for each mm -hmm. other. And we have uh, stage QA that, that that piece put into the framework. And a lot of the tests that Poudrier was doing for leftovers and a lot of other various checks have been moved into the ports framework itself. So now Poudrier 3.1 just calls make check plist and stage QA. But I guess this mm -hmm. makes it easier um, for maintainers to actually test them without having to set up a Poudrier. Right. They can actually do a lot of this testing without Poudrier. They can do the make check plist and stage QA without needing to set up Tinderbox or Poudrier. Mm -hmm. But I do still recommend they use Poudrier for for testing because it's uh, building in a clean environment. Yeah. And it has some additional tests that are not in the framework. And Tinderbox currently doesn't have any of these, these tests hooked up. Right. And mm -hmm. I and I'm working with a few people to get it hooked up into Tinderbox. So people will use Tinderbox and it'll pass and they'll say it has no problems. That's because it's not doing any right. tests. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is there still a lot of demand to keep Tinderbox around, or is it going to be deprecated with the old package tools? I the people who run Tinderbox are mostly away, so it's it's up to them if they want to deprecate it. But um, that's not something me or port manager can do right. or, or will say. But there is quite a bit of demand for it still. We still get a lot of people wanting to use it, and uh, which is understandable. It's it's uh, the web interface is kind of nicer. You can queue builds from there, which you can't do from Pujer. Uh -huh. I think you can. I haven't used Cinderbox actually. Okay. Yeah, neither have I. But, um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you can do some of that stuff. It's been a while since I played with it, but it did have like a, a web interface for stopping and queuing and yeah. some of that stuff. Yeah, I'm surprised people still want to use it, and we we nudge them towards Poudrier, and Poudrier has has taken off quite a bit, and most people are using the development version as as the main one. I, I really need to release the development version. It's very stable right now. Cool. So do you have access to this uh, legendary monster box that IX Systems built with all the RAM and SSDs? We know it's sitting around somewhere. Uh, I don't know. It's like the 40-core system. How much it's got like a terabyte memory? of RAM and like eight SSDs. But I don't I think, think uh, I've, I've got that I think, system, but I, there's... I think uh, Constantine was using it to do some Postgres benchmarks recently, so I imagine you wouldn't have been able to use it at the same time. Yeah. I think he was using uh, Ape One in the NetPerf cluster. Oh, okay. Attilio, Rao, and I were also doing some Postgres testing and benchmarking on another system in in that cluster. With it had 40 CPU as well, but it didn't have all these SSDs and on there that you, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. <laughs> cool. Uh, so, how's the uh, Port Manager Lurker project going? That's been very successful. We. Um, from the first, I think it was the first or second batch we brought in Matt and, and Anton, and from another batch, um, well, Steve Wills was never officially in the Lurker program, but he has recently joined Port Manager as well. Um, he was kind of invited in to a, the 
for Manager Lurker's IRC channel, but never the mailing list. But he is now part of the, the group. And now we've taken on two more people, uh, Nivit and WG. But overall, it's been really it's been really good at uh, revitalizing Port Manager and getting more activity and people involved with Port Manager as well. That's good. Uh, is there anything uh, like a project to get more people working on ports, like even just like maintainers and, and people writing patches and stuff? There hasn't been any recruitment efforts, no. That's something we probably should be doing more. Yeah. Uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, earlier in the show, we did a uh, or talked about a uh, NetBSDs. There, somebody wrote an article about package sharks, and part of it was kind of like a quick start guide to writing a to building a port. Uh, and I was mm -hmm. kind of thinking that you know, the the porter's handbook is very good, but it's, you know, it's kind of like a quick start guide to go at the front of that might be very handy. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I think there is some stuff in there about using. Um, new file and there's a, an example port in there as well there's a port called i think it's called new file that'll generate a, a template port for oh. you i'll have to look at that and, you know yeah. use my doc made it come in handy a couple times <laughs> <laughs> so are there uh, any plans to do an exp run of the ports tree against the new libra ssl to test capat see what's broke I, I think there is a request for that um and x runs is another big problem of port manager actually because people will send a patch in and we have to manually, we manually go and run that build. And we set it up and we compare it against a, a baseline build that doesn't have that patch in there. And so by now uh, doing our daily builds, we actually have these baselines also running that we can compare against. And I do have a project planned that I need to make time for to allow us to just queue XBruns up into a system and have it dispatch them to available servers. Mm. But I haven't had time for that. But I, I know that uh, I, I believe Subco and someone else, the Subco PKG, has been working on Libray SSL for ports and allowing it to be used in the framework. Mm. Cool. Uh, is there anything else you, you wanted to mention to people that are watching? Um, can't think of anything. Oh, cool. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today, yes. Brian. Thank you for all the good information. Yeah. Sure. Well, you guys keep up the hard work over there. I know it's a, it's a big job. There's a lot of ports and a lot of edge cases, things that always have to be fixed. Yeah. Yes, I spent uh, last week with Babt and uh, some of the other people working on package and a lot of good stuff going on and a lot of problems I've had to overcome. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Brian. And we'll be back with our next segment in just a moment. We're back. And before we head into our weekly, quickly uh, done news roundup, we, of course, want to mention our other sponsor for the show this week, uh, of course, TarSnap. Yes. Which, again, if you're not backing up your data, first of all, stop yes. that. You need or to back up your data that, now. As <laughs> or start it, yes, in this case. Back up your data now, uh, or I'm going to come and delete it. <laughs> that's right. Alan will hunt you down, and, and you will be hacked. Yes. But uh, anyway. Yeah, if you're going to back it up, though, tar snaps definitely what you want to look at for doing it. And, uh, you know, we've gone over the reasons in the past, but again, yeah, I mean, how much is your data worth to you, first of yeah. all? I mean, let's look at it first, just in the backup perspective. Do you back up your data off site? If not, give tar snap yeah. a look. You need to get your data backed up off site because you can't guarantee when Act of God is going to happen. Exactly. Your house is going to burn down, flood, fire, earthquake, tornado, you yeah. name it, depending on where you live. When we're in Washington, we had to worry about volcanoes. So you never yeah. know. Right? Every place has something. Yes. Does so, your backup scenario course, consider volcanoes and the NSA? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the other yes. side of it, right? If if you're going to now do the backup, do you want it to be something that people can't snoop on? Exactly. I mean, do you trust uh, organizations not to give over keys or, or answer requests, say, from government agencies who maybe want to snoop and look at your data exactly. for whatever reason that may so be? Rather than having to trust the agency... Instead, mm -hmm. you encrypt it with a key only you have, and you never give it to the place that you're sending your data to, and so you know for a fact that they can't take a look at it. Right. And, uh, Correct. And that's that's a feature. Lo that's, lots of other know, places try to sell you, you this them. exact thing. The difference is they don't give you the source code for the client so you can verify it and mm -hmm. compile it yourself. Well, because you might notice the shadow copy that gets sent to the... <laughs> exactly. Or, <laughs> or, or, you know, people. that the key is not is actually backed up in case you forget your password or oh, something yeah, like that. Yeah, 
Well, the beauty of Tarsnap is it is open source. So don't take our word for it. And you know, definitely don't take Colin's word for it. He's the author. Go look exactly. at it yourself. If you really want to be sure that this is doing what he claims it does, then definitely go look at the code. Exactly. I mean, he even offers bug exactly. bounties. If you find something wrong, send it in so you can earn some money here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, this is that just benefits That'll everyone. Add up to a lot of free backups. Take this serious. <laughs> yes, that will. That will. But of course, uh, you know, starting with tar snaps, pretty cheap. Yep. So depending on how much you're backing up, I mean, five bucks may last you a long exactly. time. But uh, you can just deposit money as you need to. And I think he's still taking uh, bitcoins yes, and stuff, right? Bitcoins as well. Yeah. So, so how cool is you know, that? If, so, if you don't want the government to even know that it's your files that he's storing, then. <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So definitely, again, uh, that URL is tarsnap.com slash BSD now. So take a look at that and uh, get signed up there. Let them know that we sent you. Yep. Okay, next up, we got the news roundup. So first up, a neat article about setting up SSH two-factor authentication mm-hmm. on FreeBSD. I actually did this about 20 minutes before the show, Alan. Oh, nice. That was easy. I got it done in about six minutes. <laughs> just <laughs> just kind of walking through the steps. But uh, we've mentioned stories in the past on how to do two-factor authentication yeah. with YubiKey or via third-party website. But uh, this blog post tells you how to do exactly that, but with your Google account and the PAM Google Authenticator port, which should be in uh, most package trees yep. if you're running something that's got a current package set. So uh, using this setup, every user that logs in with a password is going to have an extra step that gets prompted. It's going to ask for the for the authentication code before you can log in with your password. So again, two-step. If you have a public key, you can still log in normally, though. So this is uh, pretty stinking cool. I was really pleased to see how easy that was to set up. Yep. Of course, take a look at the link if that's something you're interested in doing on your box. Okay, yep. next up, we have an support for okay. uh, rate limiting so that you can stop people from oh, trying yes. to log in yep. more than three times in 30 seconds and cool stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It does. It has some you know little little things you can put in there, too, where... Uh, if your times maybe skewed a little bit between the host and the client you're connecting from, right. you can and increase some of the delay. There, yeah, there's things like you know, you open up the SSH session over really slow Wi-Fi. It takes a minute. You get the prompt, and then you have to take out your phone mm-hmm. and do what you have to unlock it and do it yeah. and start up the, and then finally get this code, and then you have to type the code in. It could take a couple of seconds, so that's all adjustable how you want it. And uh, yep. it was interesting uh, in an interview we'll have coming this- up. In the next couple of weeks, uh, we interviewed the FreeBSD security officer and talked with him about a system similar to this that he built uh, for the university where he works and on uh, his efforts to get this ported into FreeBSD uh, so that oh, you can have your cool. own uh, system instead of relying on Google's. Mm-hmm. Oh, this will even do, it looks like, rate limiting as mm-hmm. well. You know, No more than three login attempts every 30 seconds, so you can do some of that. But yeah, very cool. Uh, again, it was so simple, an article. It's literally like add this line, install this package, yep. run a command, and you're done. Exactly. So <laughs> that was pretty easy. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, next up, we have a neat article about t- ditching tape backups in favor of FreeNAS. So what's this author talking to us about? Right. So at the place he worked, they were using... Um, uh, LTO one tapes, and uh, the amount of errors they got was astronomical. Each day, one to two mm-hmm. hours was being spent on rerunning failed backups, replacing tapes that had worn out, uh, you know, doing restores to make sure the stuff was actually working, and had quite a bit of trouble. Uh, sure. So they had about one terabyte of data that they were trying to back up to the LTO tapes, and you know that was several tapes worth because LTO one tapes are fairly small. Uh, mm-hmm. They didn't require data to be archived for all that long. They just needed about three months worth. Uh, but they never formally destroyed anything until like five years. But anyway, uh, their sure. system was breaking down. And so they looked at a new one. Uh, you know, they thought about like a SAN from like an EMC or NetApp or something like that, but that was too expensive. They looked at mm-hmm. a new tape system, getting LTO5 tapes. Uh, but, you know, with any kind of tape, there's still user error and. And the tapes were keeping out the same set of problems. Exactly, it's it's like switching to slightly bigger tapes that are slightly faster. Still didn't really solve the problem. Uh, mm-hmm. Buying a NAS made by somebody else. Um, a lot of these are more on the small business home type market, and they're just they can be expensive, and and you don't really know what's going on inside. So if something goes wrong, you can sure. be just as screwed. Uh, so solution number three was building uh, a NAS and doing free NAS on it, uh, and this way they could get ZFS and get snapshots and, and all that and be able to store the data and be a little more certain that when they go to read it, it'll still work. 
Mm -hmm. So it looks like he just took an old workstation, put it to use with uh, three two terabyte drives, yep. and then threw a fourth uh, 70 gig drive in there for running the actual FreeNAS system. Well, that's pretty cool. So he set up as a RAID Z1, which would be some of course, RAID 5, two drives, one spare. It says he's tested it for uh, about six months. Then he decided to build a production server using six three terabyte drives in a RAID Z2 configuration, which is still running really yep. well. So the article pretty much just goes through the rest of his experiences with that, what his FreeNAS file structure looked like, uh, how he did backups. It looks like uh, he created some stuff with Symantec Backup Exec 2012. Yes, using disk-to-disk-to-disk -to -disk -to -disk backup. Because uh, normally mm -hmm. you'd copy from the disk on the... Uh, one of the options is copy from the disk uh, on the machine that you're backing up to a spool, basically, a disk on a server, and then later write that to mm -hmm. the tape because the tape can be slower and you want to pull everything over the network as quickly as possible and then write it to the tape kind of after. Uh, but instead, this one, it, after the spool, it goes to a disk for a uh, long-term storage instead. Cool. And it, he was using the SIF shares to because uh, Symantec's backup exec is for Windows. Uh, so mm -hmm. then he created the new storage dives and got it all set up. And uh, this way they can easily find the right backup archives quickly because uh, they can browse through the system and, and see what's where. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's definitely cool. And if you're looking to roll something on your own as well, that would be an interesting article to kind of follow how he did his and maybe get some ideas for your next do-it-yourself project. Yes, and uh, they're also doing uh, backup to uh, a four terabyte external drive, which they rotate. They have a couple of them, and mm -hmm. they rotate them off-site, so they always have a copy of yeah. last week's Using data off-site somewhere. Using that like their tapes. Yep. And uh, that's cool. This, this says it's saving them a lot of money, both in the initial cost. Uh, versus buying a SAN or, or a, a ready-made NAS and uh, mm -hmm. versus, you know, losing their data because their tapes uh, were worn out or something. Sure. Cool. Okay. Well, next up in the news roundup, we got NetBSD versus FreeBSD desktop experiences. So this is actually uh, somewhat, yeah, I guess he got in a little bit of heat for uh, posting this, but uh, a NetBSD and package source developer kind of wrote a blog post detailing his experiences running NetBSD on a workstation at his day job. And uh, he said specifically he became more and more disappointed with graphics performance on NetBSD. He finally decided to give FreeBSD 10 a try, especially since the new system he had had an NVIDIA card, and FreeBSD, of course, has a native NVIDIA driver. So uh, he's a pretty satisfied customer, it sounds like. He says that pretty much everything worked out of box. He just had to do a little tweaking with his XORG settings, it sounds like, and uh, away he went. It just worked. See anything else to glean out of this post here, mm -hmm. Alan? He's got uh, also an update posted after uh, he did this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, saying that, you know. Basically saying, I'm not a troll. Yes, but, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, he, he said, this is just an end user opinion on what's preventing me from running NetBSD as a desktop at work for the moment. Right. You know, just some of the graphical difficulties. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting post here, just talking about what his experience was giving it a try and how most stuff just seemed to work. So that's pretty slick. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of that was uh, probably your fault. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> it doesn't say he used PCBSD, right, but, but he still you know. rolled it with free and it. It works. Yes, but you pointed out lots of the little problems that made it using it as a desktop not as easy as it should have been. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely. it's definitely much better than it used to be. And Yeah, uh, it has definitely improved yeah, a lot with, over the years. With the work we were talking about in the pre-show, it's going to get much, much better. You know? Yeah, we're looking at newer Linux emulation, which brings us up to date, you know, Skype and all kinds of stuff. I have a little bit I can mention on that. We'll do in the PCBSD yes. section next, which... What do you know? That's <laughs> oh. what we're at. So, there we go. We had segue. A, we had last week a, uh, yeah, a good segue there. We had a uh, PCBSD Digest come out last week and uh, just talked a little bit about some of the Warden and PBI commands getting some new features. One of the features of the PBI command was we're adding the ability to create jails on the fly. So in the Warden, you'll be able to define, say, a range or pool of IP addresses and say, I want to use these for jails. And then when you install something via App Cafe, you can say just splat that in a new jail. And Give it just an grabs the next available IP address? That's yep. nice. Just grabs the next one and goes. And because we added that, it also now lets you do warden bulk creation. So you can say, here's my pool of addresses. You know, build me 25 jails right now. Ooh. And just uh, keep different, adding different addresses and host names and stuff. So it does all that for you on the fly. So this is all stuff going into our Edge package set. You can actually test that now. And 
Speaking of testing that, we've made that really easy. We announced earlier this last week that uh, we have Jenkins up and running with access to our Podrier oh. uh, build systems as well. So if you go to builds.pcbsd.org, you can take a look at that, see how our Jenkins setup is uh, running, and, and follow along with package sets. When we have successful sets get built, they get uploaded automatically. So we're, in some cases, uploading two or three new sets a day nice. of uh, packages for uh, free BSD 10 edge and we also have a 10 stable image which just got built and uploaded as well cool so you'll be able to follow along with those builds and we're doing the work to integrate all that with uh, jenkins as well that's nice because i oh. i updated my laptop to 10 stable manually uh mm -hmm. which it's pcbsd but then i just did a a new kernel yeah, of world over top of it <laughs> it still well, works cool thing except is, uh, for uh the little script you have that rewrites uh the package repos pcbsd.com mm -hmm. every minute that oh oh yeah every time you do an update to packages what you can do is uh, on the new one when you update your packages alan there's a uh, in user local etsy pcbsd.com you can set a custom url uh, in there that so it won't blow away whatever yes, you want because i was using that as the default yeah repo. i was using 10 stable which you didn't have a repo for yet so every time i did package mm -hmm. update it was like it would stop because one of the repos doesn't work just yeah. it kind of might Go be a bug in package that it stops if one of the repos, even though there's two other repos oh, that do work, sure. if one of them doesn't work, it breaks down. That that it might failed. actually be something we need to talk to uh, well, Brian about. Well, we have about. a our, our ten stable was just uh, just built. I think it's ten stable as of like two weeks ago, yeah. so it's pretty current. I'm tagging them by month, so we're going to try and do a monthly ten stable nice. role, and it has a full package repo to go along with it. So, and we're great. updating that package repo along with the edge one. So that one's getting updated a couple times a day too. So That'll if you'd like great. to hop over to yeah. that, you can grab it and you'll get all these new latest changes. It's doing all the builds for us automatically. Well, yeah, I'm just doing a lot with uh, Beehive and stuff. And so mm -hmm. uh, partly because I wanted to play with that new Linux emulation stuff and I didn't want to put that on top of uh, PCBSD. And so it's like, sure. well, I'll do it in a Beehive. So then sure. it's like, oh, I need the newer version of Beehive that works better. <laughs> Of course. Well, the, the plan is going forward. I don't know if we're going to do currents just yet because it is a lot of extra mm -hmm. work getting all the ports we need to build on current, but 10 stable wasn't so bad. So we're going to try and do monthly stables. Nice. So you'll get a new world once a month with a new repo to go along with it matching that, that world. That should be so, exactly right. what I'd like. Yeah, and that's about, you know, that's new enough, bleeding edge enough that you can play with and it, but not too delayed much. Delayed enough that it's, it's, you I guys mean, will have time to find a problem if there is, like, you know, yes. It's like, oh, something we merged yesterday broke everything, and that just happened yeah, to be where or, we built. And, you know, yeah. It was like GNOME 3 wouldn't build on 10 stable, so we had to have a little time to fix yep. that and make sure all the desktops are available and whatnot. But uh, that's the plan going forward. So your uname A will show you know, 10 stable July 2014 as the, as the release nice. date, and then we'll update that for you. Um, speaking of testing, though, just as a warning, we did post this to the mailing list today. If you're on the Edge package set where you just pushed uh, package ng 10.3.0 into our source tree for testing, the release candidate 2 version, so the next package set that comes in on Edge, if you don't want to test that just yet, if it's a little too bleeding edge for you, just hold off. Let us uh, you know, take the arrows on that one, get it, get it all working, make sure it's up to snuff before we uh, release the well, official yeah, one. I, I, I'm pretty sure 1.3.0 is supposed to be pretty stable. Um, at, That's at what the I'm devs, hearing. BAPT wanted us to try it first. Yes. <laughs> uh, at the Dev Summit, most of the talk was about package 1.4 and 1.5. <laughs> mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, yeah, they're, they're pushing yeah, it. Yeah, uh, they got a bunch of interesting stuff coming up, including... Um, um, abstracting the repos a little bit so that you could have like cpan as a repo so that you okay. could uh, instead of having to rebuild uh, bsd pan and probably doing the same thing so you can get you know your ruby gems or your python things or mm -hmm. whatever different external repos that could just with a little bit of tweaking uh fit right into the package system uh and oh, the fantastic. other one oh uh making it so that you can install a port using the package command so that when mm -hmm. you do package upgrade, it knows that that one you built as a port, probably with custom options, and that rather than downloading it from the repo, it should recompile it from ports. Oh, that's really cool. Is that a 1.4 or 1.5 feature? I'm not, I forget. Uh, and the other thing they're okay. also going to do is um, there'll be a package for the ports tree. So that... Mm -hmm. uh, normally, when you download the packages, like the official FreeBSD repo is built like once a week. Um, sure. So if you want to custom build a couple of packages, it works much better if you're using exactly the same port street that they did. 
So mm-hmm. they're distributing their the version of the porch tree they used when they compiled the package set. So, so you can install that. So you can customize any package you want, but using the exact same porch tree as all the packages you already have installed. And that would get updated. Yeah, I want that exactly. now. I, I would love that now. So that would replace us needing port snap essentially yep. as it well, is. right? It would, okay. uh, and it'd probably be faster a little bit just because it doesn't have to look for the changes. It'll know what they are. That is fantastic. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So lots of exciting stuff yeah. coming with package NG. <laughs> Plus, you know, looking at packaging the base system and uh, being able to do that for jails as well and uh, mm-hmm. making it deal with your upgrading your ETC files and yeah, uh, manage all yes. that. Yes, uh, cool. lots of good stuff coming up. So yes, it would be good to get to one three zero tested and uh, proved and out the door, so that they can focus on one four and one five mm-hmm. well, and all of these. If great you're running features. our our ten point zero or ten stable branches of Edge, like I said, That's keep an my eye out. Runs, probably be so uh, tomorrow awesome. when we start pushing those out. So hopefully it doesn't break too much. It sounds like it won't. Yep. So it's uh, we're just mostly it's supposed to confirm. Solve, it's all good. Uh, the one big problem of. You know, when it switches versions of Perl, it won't just say, oh, you can't yeah, install because of conflicts. It's like, oh, I yeah, see that should. this is an obvious upgrade, and I will just make it work. Mm-hmm. Uh, That'll be really Yeah, handy. I got to meet the guy that wrote that new solver code uh, at uh, Cambridge. Sadly, oh, cool. didn't get to corner him for an interview just yet, but I'll oh. hunt him down. Hey. <laughs> well, one other little tidbit I'll throw out there. So earlier in the week, I ported over Pipelight Ooh. to uh, the previous deport tree. So... If you're somebody who wanted to run, say, Silverlight applications, which lets you watch, say, video streaming sites and yeah, whatnot, I'm say the, that the is only now in the thing I've ever tree. seen uh, Silverlight used for is Netflix. And yeah, Amazon Instant Video uses ah, okay. it too, so we can watch Amazon I don't think Amazon there's a Canadian Instant version video. of that, so I've never heard of it. <laughs> okay, okay, but yeah, but yes. so that's now in the Ports tree, and uh, we're just waiting for some 64-bit packages to get built. And once that happens, you'll just build a package at it, and away you go. It also lets you run, like, the Windows versions of uh, Flash uh, and stuff, too. And they have some other plugins. Yeah, so running Flash yeah. version 14 on FreeBSD, that will also be amazing. Yeah. yeah, that'll be really cool. So keep an eye out for that. That is coming soon to a repo near you. Awesome. <laughs> cool. We'll be back in just a moment with our next segment. Okay, and we're back with our uh, questions and answers segment. First up this week, we got a question from Jeffrey asking about ZFS Send. He says, oh, Hi guys, you mentioned in episode 42 while answering Fongaboo's question that you can assign a regular user to do ZFS replication, receive only, or send as well, he's asking. He's hoping to be able to get more details on that. He said he was trying to look in the PCBSD handbook but couldn't find any particular section that looked like it would fit. He said he'd appreciate pointers for both FreeBSD and PCBSD. Uh, well, well, it is in our handbook. Give me okay. one uh, more. Yeah, I will pull up the link for you and paste it in the uh, show I wrote notes. a section on it for the FreeBSD handbook. Uh, it's just not in committed yet. Uh, it's it's okay. still undergoing review because it's part of a giant chapter. It's like 20,000 words, so it takes a bit to review. Um, sure. So I've included a link to that uh, in the show notes. Uh, but basically, yes, you can set it up so that a user can do the ZFS send or receive. Uh, the receive has one small complications. In order to mount the data set, you need to set a FreeBSD sysctl, uh, vfs.usermount equals one, which allows a regular user to mount a directory. Also, uh, the directory they mount it to, they have to own that so that they can't mount something over slash mm-hmm. etc and uh, you know change the master.password file so they know the root password or something evil like that. Uh, sure. But yes, uh, I guess they have a version of that in the PCBSD wiki as well, but it yep. uh, walks you through the steps so that Especially when you're doing this with SSH keys, you definitely don't want to have to do that with root or, or give sudo mm-hmm. involved. It's much better if you can just definitely. do it as a regular user. And this is actually how we do the uh, PCBSD package repo at Scale Engine. It's actually mm-hmm. done with ZFS replication and uh, a separate PCBSD user that's unprivileged. Cool. Yep. Yeah, well, I posted the link in our show notes as well. So afterwards, take a look. You'll see in ours, it's basically in the backing up to a free NAS system. It shows you the ZFS allow commands you would run to give permission to allow a regular user to uh, receive those. Okay, well, hopefully we answered your question there. Next up, we have uh, Bruce. So he says, uh, hey, guys, longtime Linux user here. Recently, my cheap home access point and modem router have been giving me some headaches. So he thought, what a great time to experiment with BSD. And it's always a good time to experiment with BSD. But he says he has a question. Can I use any equipment out there? Or are there specific characteristics I should look for? I know my current modem run, runs Linux because I telnet into it, found BusyBox running, and poked around a bit. 
The access point is closed. It can only be accessed through a web interface. I was thinking of using my current equipment as a sacrificial victims and then acquiring decent ones later on. He says it may be a basic question, but he couldn't find the type of information anywhere, so he hopes we can help him. Mm-hmm. So do you have any tips out that there? Really what depends. To as far as I know, there's only uh, very specific bits of hardware that people have ported FreeBSD to run on. Uh, in general, mm-hmm. the best solution for this would be to take a regular PC and uh, buy yeah. the, one of the supported wireless devices and stick it in there, and then you can run PFSense or something on it. That way you have the command line and mm-hmm. the web user, user interface and uh, wireless that works. Okay. Um, often it's cool. not so much the wireless part of the little devices that's crap, but you know the actual networking part, you know the DCP server and, and more importantly the NAT. A lot of these tiny devices have a ridiculously small amount of RAM, so they can only do so many mm-hmm. states at once. And when you run into that limit, you have problems. Uh, so my approach was actually been I, you know, I took the regular off-the-shelf access point, uh, went into its web interface, changed its IP address a little bit and disabled its DHCP and all of its other features and just mm-hmm. set it so that it had a static IP address assigned from uh, and set up so that it would forward traffic. Or Actually, it didn't need anything. So I just give it an IP address that wasn't in the way uh, and hooked it up to the network. And then that way, when a client connected to the wireless and they sent the DHCP request, the access point wouldn't would ignore it because it didn't have the DHCP turned on and it would go across the mm-hmm. network and hit my PFSense, which would answer. And then oh, there you go. Uh, the PFSense does all the work and the uh, the wireless router is now doing just wireless, which it's usually sure. perfectly good at. What it's good yeah, at, and, yeah. And leaving all the NAT and the rules and all the complicated stuff in the sessions uh, up to the PFSense, which can handle it. That's a very clever idea, Alan. I should uh, consider doing and, that and, here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the wireless that does it is a little USB-powered thing I bought for $20 in Japan. But, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, before that, I did it with, a, I had like a little Netgear off-the-shelf thing. Uh, the reason I switched to the Japanese one, it was it has N, and the and Netgear I have was only G. Yep. And, oh, there you go. You know, you can't pass up one of the- supporting VLANs and stuff. On, with a little Japanese mm-hmm. thing does VLAN, so I actually... It has multiple <laughs> SSIDs, and depending which one you associate with, you get a different VLAN. And so my That's PFSense really cool. then routes you differently. So if you join my mm-hmm. guest Wi-Fi access point, you can't see other computers on my network. You can use the internet, and that's mm-hmm. it. Whereas if you join you know, my office VLAN, then you can see all the machines in my office. And if you join my home VLAN, you can talk to my media center and so on. Sure, uh, sure. But in general, yeah, you can just... Uh, Either buy a wireless card that's known to work with PFSense. They have a list of them on their website and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. Or use an existing thing and just uh, make it kind of into a dumb AP instead of a, a router and let your uh, PFSense or some other FreeBSD or OpenBSD machine do the actual routing part uh, because specifically the NAT, uh, they can do a lot more translations. I think the default on PF is like 10,000 concurrent states and it's one line in the config file to increase that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cool. Okay, well, hopefully we answer your question there, and good luck with that. So next up, Richard, he says, love the show. He has a few quick questions on ZFS. He says, first, number one, do you use hardware grade at all, or do you specify uh, JBOD down HBAs for all your ZFS setups? Have you ever tried to upgrade firmware on disk drives in a ZFS pool? Any advice on doing this? Do you take the disks offline one by one? Well, for my part, I've never used a hardware RAID when I've done my yeah, ZFS um, setups. How about you, yeah, Alan? You definitely shouldn't use hardware RAID. It's redundant and unnecessary. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> so. usually it will cause problems because it'll try to hide stuff from ZFS, whereas ZFS, knowing that, would let it handle things better. Um, so yeah, especially, uh, the biggest problem is people do like a hardware RAID 5 and then expose that as one device to ZFS, and ZFS does check something, finds that there's an error, but can't repair it because it doesn't have a second copy. Whereas if you sure, expose sure. those five devices or however many disks to ZFS to re- is individually, it would have it with would, Z1 the same redundancy levels as the RAID five. It would know where to find a copy of that block and fix it. So using hardware RAID can you're, actually you're be, losing some of yeah, the features. You're, yeah, some of the most important ones. Um, mm-hmm. Depending on the controller, it could be JBOD or mine. Mostly, it's just you don't configure it at all, and it just passes the devices through without looking at them, mm-hmm. and that works best. Um, and the, have you ever had to upgrade firmware? Uh, I've yours? never had to update the firmware on the drives. Me neither. Um, 
mm-hmm. if I was going to, yes, but you can you can use the zpool offline command to take one disk mm-hmm. offline at a time and update it. The main advantage there mostly will be that uh, there won't be anything else going on in the disk that might get in the way, or you know, sure. something tries to read a file off that disk and and times out because the disk was busy doing a firmware update or something. So if you just mm-hmm. use the offline do the update and then online one at a time. Uh, it'll also do the resilver and catch those disks up. Uh, the biggest advantage to ZFS there is if you ho- offline a disk and online it again with hardware RAID, it resilvers the entire disk, which, you know, it might be four yeah, terabytes. That could be a while. Whereas ZFS yeah. will know, it'll look at the disk and see the transaction log and be like, oh, you're just missing these last 10 transactions. Yeah, you're 10 megabytes yeah. behind or something. And it just gets you caught up quick and it makes it, that's yep. definitely better. And plus, if your firmware goes up and it goes wrong on that one first drive, you know, not to touch the other ones too. But no, I, I don't ever do firmware updates on my disks unless there's yeah, a need to. I've, I've, general rule of thumb, firmware updates only when absolutely yeah, necessary. Yeah, I've, I've never had a disk that was affected by something that needed that. I've been mm-hmm. lucky that, uh, you know, the disks I bought weren't the versions that had that problem uh, or they sure. came already upgraded. Or I would usually upgrade them before I put them in the machine. Of course, that assumes that you didn't find out about the problem after the fact. Um, Mm -hmm. it also depends sometimes uh, depending on the drive and the firmware and stuff sometimes the firmware tool requires booting into like a a FreeDOS environment or something in which case there's no ZFS at all and you're going to have to take the whole thing offline for a while while you update the the firmwares and then his uh, second question was about SATA drives behind SAS expanders Um, I purposely try to avoid this because of the same reason people have always said uh, specifically SAS Mm -hmm. Uh, expanders only speak SAS, uh, or specifically the controllers do, and so the expanders have to translate when they do SATA, and it's never quite as good as the native thing. And so, in particular, you can have problems where if one SAS drive is, or sorry, if one SATA drive is failing or taking a long time because it's internally retrying a read because it failed, uh, it can cause everything behind the expander to pause which can sure. cause a lot of problems. So it's much better if you can do what I did is I went to IX systems and bought a system that's called discrete wire, where each drive mm-hmm. is wired back one to one to the controller. It meant buying a second uh, HBA, but you know, those, it's those HBAs, end. because they're not the ones that support RAID, right, buying two of them was cheaper than buying one that did support RAID. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, basically the, Savings uh, by using the cheaper disks and buying a couple more HBAs was actually better for me. Yeah, that's cool. And well, good. Well, I'm not 100% oh, good. sure, but I'm quite sure that that's how Netflix does it. Uh, they discrete wire mm-hmm. each of their disks to it because they're using off-the-shelf SATA disks as well. Uh, Correct. And they didn't want to use expanders because every time they tried, it went bad. Uh, so, yeah, sure. they just run a couple, uh, like two 16-port LSIs, I think. And then wire Mm -hmm. those up to each of the 30 drives or whatever. uh, And that's how they make it work. So, yes, if you can avoid using a SAS expander, I would. Okay. Hopefully answer your question there, Richard. Next up is Jeff. He asks also a hardware-related question. So he said he's in the hunt for a laptop that's compatible with FreeBSD. He says Ubuntu and Red Hat have hardware compatibility lists everywhere else on the net. You can find wikis and notes for non-distro but Linux-specific stuff. What about for FreeBSD? He uh, is one resigned to pouring through the mailing list search engine results, or is there some sort of centralized repository of notes or info for FreeBSD or even any other BSD? Um, a little so, bit uh, of both. Um, yeah. The release notes list specific hardware, like you know these Intel chips work, or specifically... Uh, if you look up, if you do like MAN IWN, which is the Intel wireless network driver, one of the Intel wireless mm-hmm. drivers, it has a list of the wireless chips that are supported by that driver. Uh, that doesn't tell you which models of ThinkPads have that one, partly because sure, that's, a, oftentimes it's yeah. <laughs> it's not a one-to-one mapping. Like, you know, the ThinkPad T530, when you customize it at Lenovo, you have an option of six different wireless cards. And mm-hmm. so when it came down to that, I just went and looked up which ones worked with Intel and bought the fanciest one that, uh, or w- the fanciest one that worked on FreeBSD, which for me was sure. the 6205 uh, Centrino Advanced N, uh, which mm-hmm. I, I'll find out you can buy as a little mini PCI card thing uh, for about $17 at the computer store, which is great too. So if you happen to yeah. have one that doesn't work, you can just replace the little card with one that does. Mm-hmm. Um on the FreeBSD wiki, yes. there are a list of some laptops, uh, basically ones people have, and they list what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there's a list of uh, 
laptops that are guaranteed to work with FreeBSD, partly because, you know, if you say Lenovo T530, my T530 works great. Yeah. So my T520 works. Yeah. It's like, this one works this way. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> if you bought a slightly different customized version, yours might not work. And so it's really hard mm-hmm. to list what laptops do work and which don't. Sure. So he also asks, uh, he'd like to verify he sees nothing at all related to ThinkPads in the 10.0 hardware notes except for CD-ROM drive. Should I therefore assume the rest of the ThinkPad hardware is not working? Well, he says specifically, such a track point, fingerprint um, reader. The track point works, cause that's, but that won't be listed as... Well, I guess the track point's the little red thing, not the track pad. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that works. I don't. I don't know what that might be listed as. The touchpad, like the actual, the regular one, will be listed as synaptic, not as uh, tra- uh, ThinkPad. And you know, the wireless mm-hmm. won't say ThinkPad. It'll say you know Intel Centrino or whatever. And and sure. you know, the disc controller will be under like Intel or whatever. And so it mm-hmm. it, it can be kind of difficult to find what works and what doesn't. Uh, part mm-hmm. of that is just because you know, the manufacturers don't uh, have like this fixed part list. You know, you can order the exact same laptop at six months apart and get different components. And so it's really sure. hard to authoritatively say this one will work or this one won't and so on. I'll point out one thing we've done in the past. If you have a computer store, if you're actually shopping retail for this and not ordering online, um, you can use our PCBSD ISO boot it on a store model or whatever. And there's just a button you click in the corner that'll check and make sure there's a working Wi-Fi driver, oh, you know, sound works, et cetera. Yeah. And it'll just show you check boxes like, yep, found Wi-Fi, found sound, found this, found that's that. A, that's a great idea. Just put, it'll put check it your video on a, as well. a USB stick and take it to the store and look at the, the model yeah. they let you play with. Boot yeah. it off the USB just stick. Just ask them if they'll let you boot it. Yeah, mm-hmm. which, yeah, they usually don't care. You're not going to break it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you can verify that it'll work before you buy it. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, and if if you want to, you know, dig into something, of course, you can bring up a terminal there and poke around a little further. But nine times out of ten, if it has a checkbox, it says, okay, we found the Intel driver for your Wi-Fi card. We found a video chipset that has acceleration. It'll it'll do all that for you and let you know if that's a safe one to buy or not. Yeah, what we need is one of those like that that dumps all the details and finds things that don't work and then give it Mm -hmm. to somebody that works at a computer store and they will just do every laptop as each new model comes out (laughs) and send us a list. It's like... (laughs) Uh, Lenovo seems identified. to be shipping all their new laptops with this wireless. We should add driver for that. <laughs> that would actually be a really cool yeah. idea. Yeah, <laughs> doing that. Okay. There you go. Hopefully that'll give you some ideas on how to uh, search for the best one, yeah. though. But, uh, yeah, if you go to the, the FreeBSD wiki, there's a list of laptops that uh, people have had, and it tells you what works and what doesn't. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, if, So me and Alan both run Lenovo's. Yes, uh, the Lenovo's generally work when, you, when you're customizing Lenovo. Uh, if you do, you can, you know, when you get a list of different wireless, you can look up and, and you know, verify, you know, I want that one because I know that one works or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, specifically, at the moment, the hard part is that um, the KMS stuff in FreeBSD doesn't support the Haswell stuff. So you want an yes. i5 or i7 that starts with 3,000, not 4,000. Uh, which are getting harder to find because everything's updated to new Haswell models. But in this case, you Mm -hmm. probably want the slightly older model so that the onboard uh, Intel graphics work as opposed to not. Well, unless it has an NVIDIA discrete or NVIDIA card that can do discrete mode, which is how I run my laptop. That's how I run mine as well. That works well too. Mine actually works in the Intel only mode now as well uh, with 10 in the Mm -hmm. KMS because I have the Ivy Ridge, not the Haswell. Yeah, same here, same here. Cool. Okay. Well, next up, we have a question from Steve. He said he uh, he decided to want to try out BSD with ZFS and JLS. He just can't seem to have any success without with following the instructions for installing either FreeBSD 10 release or PCBSD 10.02 um, without ending up at a mount root prompt with an error two. Oh, that's interesting. He says he's trying to install on a one terabyte Seagate hard drive just FreeBSD or PCBSD by itself. It's interesting that doing the same thing with new Linux always works. Um, he doesn't mention, is this an internal drive or an external? Maybe it's a USB drive that's but, timing out, and that's why the mount prompt. Right, yeah. It'd be interesting to have a more of an interactive session with him and see if we can't get it to work. But mm-hmm. I say, because if both of them really fail, mention, I mean, there's got to be something common. Right, but he, he also doesn't mention if he was trying UFS or ZFS. and stuff. I do wish we gave a well, better... if he's doing PCBSD, he's using right. ZFS, because that's all uh, we're doing. I do wish that our mount group things would say something better than just error 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I was going to say but at though, that point, you know, you don't even have most of the kernel yet, so I guess it's kind of hard to do anything more than that. But mm-hmm. 
Well, I say my thought was, again, if you're doing, say, an external USB stick or, or drive or something that's not showing up fast enough, I think, was you going to hit space or enter Allen? Um, I'll try again. Period will make it sleep for one period. second. You might have to do that okay. two or three times. Then you'll see this big chunk of text will come up. And then... Yeah, like, hey, I've come alive yeah. now. And then, if you, uh, and then if you type question mark, it'll list all the valid things. And then you have to know what to do there. It's a little complicated. Mm -hmm. Um but generally, yeah, it should I would, be okay. Uh, like even using virtual USB devices transatlantically, I usually don't have that much trouble. Yeah, I don't either typically. But I'm curious, you know, since you said both free and PCBSD wouldn't boot on it, if you could get in contact with us over on the PCBSD side, you know, go to our track bugs tracker and post your info and let us take a look at what's going on here. We'd be curious to see if we can solve it for you. Um, He's, you know, well, we'll have you try some different things, you know, GPT versus MBR. Et right. Uh, he's saying here that at the mount root prompt, when he types question mark, he doesn't see ADA zero, which would be his hard drive, uh, which could be the problem. But the installer sees it, right? Yeah, he installed he can to it. Um, install to it. Although, if it's a USB device, it'll actually be DA zero, not ADA zero. Mm -hmm. um, True. And it'll probably depend on his stuff. Uh, that or if it's behind some kind of controller where the driver's not loaded, but the installer loads the driver, so it should. Yeah, yeah. We definitely. So um, the PCBSD, the installer should be the same as the as the installed yeah. system. We don't do anything special on the installer that's not done on the live. Um, but yeah, open a track ticket. I mean, yeah. I'd love to hack on it. I'm sure if you write us back, we'll we'll be happy to interact with you and see if we can figure out what exactly is going on here. Yeah, so when you boot it into the FreeBSD installer and drop to a shell, when he does gpart show, he can see the partitions and he can import the, mm -hmm. the ZFS pool. Yeah, so he can talk to them. Yeah, him. so that's, that's weird. I don't know if it's just the device not showing up or if it's somehow missing something. Yes, it, Mm -hmm. I'm sure that can be solved, and uh, we're sorry that your experience, your first experience with BSD was that complicated. Normally, it just works. Yeah, it should. So that's why, that's why in particular, I would love to see if there's some kind of weird driver or something that we need to load to, mm -hmm. to make sure it can do its thing. Okay, well, cool. Well, that was the last question we had for this week. So as we end the show, of course, we just want to mention some of the usual stuff that uh, all the tutorials are going to be posted in their entirety at bsdnow.tv. You can always send your questions, comments, show ideas, or topics, or stories you'd like to mention on the show to feedback at bsdnow.tv. I know uh, we'd love to hear from you. TJ would love to hear from you. So when you address that, be sure you put TJ in there too when you say yes. hi, Chris, Alan. You know, TJ is the one usually responding to him as well. So yes, he answers email we, faster than I can. <laughs> yes, yes. So we do love hearing from you guys. So tell us what you think of the show or what you'd like to see. We appreciate suggestions. If you'd like to come on for an interview or you have a tutorial you'd like to see, go ahead and let us know as well. We also want to kind of give a shout out to the new FreeBSD core team. So do you want to read off the members yes. here? Uh, so uh, Gavin Atkinson, uh, David Chisnell, Baptiste Trosson, who's uh, the guy that started PackageNG, uh, Ed mm -hmm. Mast, George Neville Neal, uh, Hiroki Sato, Gleb Smirnoff, uh, Peter Wem and Robert Watson are the new core team. So that's uh, oh, quite an all-star list, and we expect many great things from them. Mm -hmm. May this core live long and prosper. <laughs> uh, and cool. the, the outgoing core team thanks uh, Doug Erlings Margrave for running the election. And mm -hmm. uh, also the core team secretary uh, changed, and uh, Gabor Pally stepped down, and it is now... Uh, Somebody whose name starts with an M that I can't remember now. Separate oh, announcement. No. Okay. But yes, there's a new core team secretary as well. So your next report will have someone else's name on it. And uh, there's cool. a new PGP key for that as well. And uh, that's on the uh, mailing list if you want need to find it. Mm -hmm. Also, we'll mention as we're closing that the first, second, and third portable releases of Libra SSL are now available on the OpenBSD FTP site. So, like, the official one has finally arrived. Yes. We don't have to uh, grab the hacked ones floating around quicker anymore. Quicker than we were originally so led to believe, I think. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really good. I'm not sure. Did it already make it in the ports tree for FreeBSD? I'm not sure. Uh, they're iterating really quickly. So, I imagine as soon as it settled down, uh, someone will make a port. If not, oh yeah, TJ says it's already in yes. the port tree. So, <laughs> Although I don't know, is, is it already version three in the port tree? What's... When when they're doing them like one a day, it it might you know some poor maintainer. Uh, yeah, but they have yeah. it building for Linux, Solaris, Mac OS X, and FreeBSD. So 
It's version 2.02 2 no. is in the port tree. So they're one version no, that's right. behind. Because yeah, 200 was the first one. So 202 is the third oh, okay. one. Well, that's, and so, yes. They just updated it today, actually, yeah. about four hours ago. So there yeah. you go. So some poor maintainer is indeed keeping up to date with that. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Of course, test it on the platform, your platform of choice, including building ports against it, and uh, report your findings, either to the LibreSSL team or the port maintainers, so we can start uh, increasing compatibility and getting more and more things switched yes, over. I think be, that's just best for everyone in the long run. It'd be run. interesting to see like a, an X run against the entire port tree using LibreSSL in place of OpenSSL. Uh, I cool. know that the, um, the LibreSSL guys already know a list of uh, apps that don't work properly with LibreSSL. At one point, it was Python. Uh, but the fix for that has been upstream to Python. Uh, it assumed if you were using OpenSSL that you had support for one algorithm that they removed in LibreSSL. Oh. Uh, okay. And so Python now properly checks for that. Uh, so it's actually a fixed issue and it's actually fixed where it okay. should have been in Python rather than in LibreSSL. Mm -hmm. But you okay. know, testing is well, the only way to find these things. So exactly. Yes. Please play with it and report your findings. So as usual, you can watch us Wednesday live, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. We'd love to have you with us as we're actually making the show, and it's cool because we can interact with you if you're on IRC and want to uh, discuss stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, see all the little bits that don't get put in the final edited show. So anyway, it's been a great show this week, guys. We're glad to have you back, Alan, yes. and we're looking forward to seeing you same time next week. Public Wi-Fi, of course, is great, but sometimes there's pretty annoying restrictions in place which prevent you from using it freely. You've probably been, say, in an airport or coffee shop, and you've seen the pay so many dollars for one hour of wireless. They take over your entire browsing section, and the network refuses to load any of the websites you actually want to go to. Sometimes, however, you can bypass these annoyances without paying a dime. So this, for this tutorial today, we're going to be relying on the very likely fact that the company who set up the network misconfigured it to allow DNS to pass through. So keep in mind, this is pretty much a last-ditch effort to get free connectivity. It's going to be pretty painfully slow for anything except more than light web browsing. So uh, you know, don't get mad at us if you can't download huge files off it. You're going to need a couple of the following things, though. You can need a remotely accessible server running SSH. Maybe a router is fine, too. A client machine, probably your laptop. And then a domain name whose records you control or an account at uh, afraid.org. So uh, once you're connected to the annoying network, the first way you're going to go ahead and test that is check the host command. So like host BSD TV or bsdnow.tv. And if you get a response like uh, BSD now has an address, something, something, you can keep on reading. If not, and they're also blocking DNS, then this method's not going to work. In such case, your best bet's likely going to be to spoof your MAC address to be as the same as one of the connected clients and then forcefully spam deauth packages and, uh, packets and take over their session, which, of course, is not very nice. Yeah. <laughs> we, can we really recommend that? <laughs> not really. The tutorial right? doesn't cover how to do it. so. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> so the tool we're going to be using today is going to be called Iodine. It's in the FreeBSD ports tree, OpenBSD ports, and, of course, NetBSD's package source, all under the net category. Install it however you like, both on the server and on your client machine. And then the next step, we're going to start setting up DNS records for your domain. So let's go ahead and take it away now, Alan. Okay, so in this tutorial, we're covering how to tunnel all your traffic as DNS queries. <laughs> Uh, this will help defeat deep packet inspection and so on. Uh, oftentimes, these free Wi-Fi's will have a captive portal, uh, but they will basically only spoof the DNS responses from the DNS servers they provide via DHCP. So if you're forced to use something like Google DNS 8.8.8.8, you'll be able to uh, get out anyway. So we can test, and we see that we do, in fact, get... Uh, DNS response. So what I've done is set up two subdomains. If you look up uh, iodine D, I can see we can see that I pointed it at the IP address of a server. And if I look up tunnel the subdomain, There we go. We can see what I've done is I've delegated the zone tunnel.allenjude.com to point to a name server. 
it's not quite right. But anyway, um, let me just grab those records for you quick there. So I've created these DNS records. Sorry, they got duplicated there. Um, so basically I point, I made an A record pointed to the server and then I delegated a subdomain to that server. So now what we can do is install iodine. Now that we have it installed, I'll, um, you can start it on the server. So from the server side, the configuration looks something like this. So we run iodine D, let's give it uh, its privilege separation user to run as, chroot it into var empty, um, set some other flags, turn on foreground mode so it won't detach and debugging so that we'll be able to see the messages, set the password. Remember the problem with this is that your password will be in plain text in the uh, process list. So depending uh, how your system's set up on FreeBSD, you can make it so that users can't see each other's process list, but really remember that this is not secure. Then you set the IP address of the server side of the tunnel, and then you specify the zone you want to use. So my command looks slightly different uh, because I've put in a, a different zone here and a different password. So that's now running on the server on the other end. So on this side, if we run the iodine client, it'll look something like this. So now the client, we run in foreground mode with this user to that, with the password, and we specify the tunnel we want to use. So now we see that it sends a DNS query figures out which type of queries are allowed and which are blocked, depending on the DNS servers you end up using. Uh, and then it set up a tunnel. And we see set up the MTU based on how large of a message it can get through the DNS servers. And it's now sending UDP data back and forth. So now if I switch to a second window on this client, I do if config tune zero, we can see that on the client side, we have a tunnel where our address is 10.0.0.2 and the tunnel on the other side is 10.0.0.1. So now we've established a tunnel between uh, the client that I'm on here and a server I have off on the internet. And uh, we can actually route traffic across that. <clears throat> If we compare that to uh, see the latency is about the same because you're just sending DNS packets. But more importantly, if we do SSH minus C, capital C for compression, now we can log in and we can see that we're actually logged in uh, over that tunnel. Now, as you imagine, it's not all that fast, but all your traffic is now not going over um, your regular TCP socket. It's actually all being routed by UDP uh, as a tunnel. So this allows you to do whatever you need to do. Uh, so this provides you with the ability to tunnel out even via firewall that's not going to let you make a connection out on 22. Whether that's just because they have a restricted firewall saying, you know, only port 80 and 443 allowed, but we allow DNS, or if it's because they have a captive portal that won't allow you to connect out at all until you pay them. As long as you can get those UDP packets through, you'll now be able to SSH. And then you can do your regular SSH tunneling to allow you to uh, route your browsing and stuff that way as well. And uh, that's about all you really need to do. You know, and you can also combine this with our S tunnel tutorial, which is basically doing the same thing except for routing it over uh, TCP port 443, or our SSH chaining tutorial, which can show you how to bounce through multiple servers uh, so that you can say, hey, on my laptop, when I SSH to this server, I need to bounce through the other end of this tunnel first uh, so that I can get out from behind this restrictive firewall. Uh, and I guess we'll have to do uh, a tunnel, uh, or a tutorial at another time showing you how to use the SOX proxy and the SSH tunneling so that you can actually connect your browser uh, via the same method. 
And that's about all there is to it. Um, you can also set it up in uh, your, oops. I broke it. <laughs> Wrong window. Anyway, uh, you can also set it up uh, to be run at startup. So you, I'll just uh, quickly show you what that would look like. So if you add something like this to your rc.conf, you'll see that iodine now is enabled. We set the password, the domain name, uh, the address to use, and then uh, the user and stuff. And I also set the uh, listen address since my server has more than one IP address and one of those is actually a DNS server. Because uh, the only downside to this system is that uh, iodine D needs to run uh, as a DNS server on whichever IP you give it meaning that you can't also have another DNS server on here. So if you have a VPS or something, it's a great place to run this. But if you're also running a DNS server, you'll need a second IP to put the iodine on uh, because the DNS server is already going to be taking that on your first IP address. And uh, that's it for the tutorial. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again next week.